Hello, everyone. Welcome back for another edition of Collider Ladies Night Pre-Party. So pre-party is all about getting to know some super cool people who are on the rise, who if you don't know them now, you are bound to know them really soon, or you probably want to know everything about them now. And that's why Sochi Gomez is with us right now. Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. You are so good in that movie. And also beyond the movie, I've obviously done a lot of digging and watched a lot of your interviews. Like what a delightful individual you are. I love your TikTok so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> I think uh, one of my absolute favorite things to come out of the uh, the Doctor Strange junket process is that meme of you. It's the I'm I mean oh. one. It's adorable. It's the sweetest thing in the world. Yeah, it's like where I'm like talking. And I'm like, well, I don't know, but <laughs> that one. <laughs> I don't know who thinks to green screen that stuff so everybody can use it, but it's like literally everything that spawned from that video is lovely. <laughs> <laughs> thank you but it was it was something that i truly did not even think was gonna uh become memed <laughs> but it's been funny getting to see all the different people that they put next to me <laughs> i'm like harry styles I agree with that. like Lawrence Pugh. i agree with that like i i agree with all of it thank you <laughs> It makes me very happy. All right. So every single Collider Ladies Night starts right here. What is the movie, the performance, or personal experience that first made you say to yourself, I have to be an actor and nothing else? <laughs> well, uh, I mean, I, I started acting when I was uh, five in musical theater. So it was just kind of doing it for fun. But probably the moment I was like, I was like, ooh, this person, I want to play this role. Um, was uh, Katniss Everdeen, uh, Jennifer Lawrence. Yeah. Um, That's such I was, a good one. I was a huge uh, Katniss Everdeen fan, and uh, I was I was Team PETA. <laughs> <laughs> I loved PETA. Um, but yeah, that was, I like dressed up as her, and yeah. And I know that Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes is coming out soon. They're like, well, I read the book, but um, I know that they're doing the movie sad i'm not in it but um i'm very 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 excited to see it <laughs> i think you're a little busy right now just a little bit <laughs> <laughs> um i'm actually uh listening to that audiobook right now myself i'm surprised yeah. i hadn't listened to it a little sooner than this but i was a huge huge hunger games fan when the books came out and now that we have that trill the four films and i just cannot yeah. wait for more. i know i'm telling you like whenever i feel like I'm kind of not bummed where like, I'm just kind of, I, I usually watch Mamma Mia and I watch Hunger Games. Those are the two that I watch. Very and Divergent. Solid. Oh, Divergent is another really good one. That was like a really good time for book to film adaptations, at least yes. for me. I love those. It was. Um, and I, I mean, I was, I literally had the Triss and the four dolls. Like I, I had them and I like had the little after, I'm telling you, I was, I loved it. <laughs> One of my very first set visits ever was to the set of Divergent and my no mind, my mind was blown. I was so excited. No way. Oh my gosh. That, that's, you're lucky. Whoa. <laughs> I, I am very lucky, but I've seen some of your uh, behind the scenes videos from Doctor Strange. Like you actually got to play with all the cool like effects and stunts and green screens. And we're going to get into that. But before I jump ahead too far. So it's one thing when you say to yourself, like, I recognize that my dream is to become an actor and I want to get there. But it's a completely different thing to actually believe that that dream is a possibility in a very, very challenging industry. So who or what first made it feel like a reality, like a possibility to you? Well, probably my mom, just because she actually put me in musical theater. Um, she just was mainly because she didn't want me to be bored. And she knew that I'm like, I was very physical, you know, like uh, very animated. And I wanted always to just entertain people. And um, and she was like, well, I'll just put you in musical theater. I mean, I have some work to do. And so I, you have to be put in this energy somewhere. <laughs> and um, the healthy choice is to do that with, musical theater. And I did uh, like 22 musicals, full length musicals um, till I was like 12. And then I started doing commercials and stuff. But yeah, she was the one who truly made it like real because it wasn't if it wasn't for her, I probably wouldn't actually be where I, I am now because it takes she had to quit her job for me. Because um, it's a lot of driving around you don't realize but like, auditions are like from Burbank all the way to Santa Monica to Hollywood to Glendale. It's just like, okay, how are you supposed to get all there and also like have a job and also have school work? It's just, it's, it's a lot. So 
you end up spending your days in the car driving around from audition to audition. <laughs> It always fills my heart to hear about parents' support in this crazy industry because it's absolutely vital. It, it is. It's and also not only that, but you just need someone by your side, you know, letting you know that you can do it, and you're you're just helping you through it and stuff. And my mom was there, there for me for sure. Oh, love hearing that so much. All right, so jumping into the first big title here, Babysitters Club. Looking yes. back now, is there anything that makes you say to yourself, like, I am so lucky that my first lead role on a big series was on that particular set with those particular people? I mean, with Babysitter's Club, that show is so special um, just because of the books, number one. I mean, that is, those books are so just very, very special. Um, and it just tells this lives of young girls and the things that they have to go through and they have to face. And, um, and the fact that they brought it to a TV, uh, series was so good. Um, and I had so much fun filming it and Dawn and I, we were literally like <laughs> the same person. So it was kind of like getting to play myself <laughs> on screen. Um, and I had so much fun just working on set with those girls because it was kind of our first projects, like our first major projects together. And it was us kind of going, okay, guys, like this is, this is our show. This is something that we're doing together and we're here for one another. And it was just, it's just been great getting to see how, you know, we've all kind of grown and how we've all done kind of, kind of gone our own ways and ways in certain ways, but also we just come back to one another. Um, we, whenever I'm in town in Vancouver, I always try to visit them. Um, but I was really sad to see that the show had ended because it was so special, you know, just to see a show that really highlighted the lives of girls and made them just, it was just really grounded and it was real, you know. Yeah, I think uh, you're not alone on that. A lot of a lot of folks out there were very, very sad when that came to an end. But I mean, yeah. as a desperate attempt to reach for the silver linings, at least it's on Netflix and we can we re rewatch the two seasons. Rewatch we got it and rewatch it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so correct me if I'm wrong on this, but when the time came to commit to Dr. Strange, it meant choosing between Babysitter's Club and Dr. Strange, right? It did. Yes. And, um, it, it was during the pandemic too. So it was, it was my choice. I was like, okay, guys, I really want to try and do both. It was like, I really wanted to literally do both. I was like, I will fly and I will, I will push it. I will try and get it to work out. And it just, it sadly didn't um, end up happening just because of COVID. It was not safe. Um, and at that time, like England had shut down their airports. So I wasn't able to even like fly to Canada. Um, and so there was actually like no way of me getting, getting there in time. Um, but I think that Kendra, the girl who took over my place, did a wonderful job. And it's not easy having to fill someone's shoes like that. Um, and she did a wonderful job, and I'm very proud of her. It really is something else. Those were incredibly tough circumstances to be working with, and the fact that like we kind of still got the best of both worlds in a yeah. way, and everyone did what they had to keep these things going is is really something else and something to be applauded. Yeah. I know it's a, it's a really tough thing to make that decision. When you're having that kind of conversation and talking through what needs to happen next, do you have anyone in your corner you lean on for advice when it comes to navigating situations like that and, you know, not tripping into like self-doubt? Like, am I choosing the right thing or the wrong thing? Yeah. You know, it's really tricky because, uh, you know, when it comes to choices like that, it's like you never know. Um, you just have to go with what your gut tells you to do. And honestly, it was just, I still look back at that and I'm like, Netflix was really cool that they just let me kind of work with Marvel and let it happen. Cause they could have said no. <laughs> um, and you know, I mean, I'm just so thankful that Netflix let me do it. <laughs> um, but I mean, it was mainly my mom and I just kind of going like, okay, you know, and it's really sad that we can't do that, but you also have to look at your, your career and see, you know, I, it, it would be amazing getting to represent, you know, so many girls and Latina girls in general. And I would of course love to be that representative. And so, um, I was like, if, if they want me, they want me. <laughs> so it was mainly that too. Your mom sounds like the absolute best. I love that so much. She is. She's always, she's always looking out for me. <laughs> 
So let's get into Doctor Strange now. I guess first, let's start with the audition process. What would you say is the biggest difference between auditioning for a Marvel movie versus anything else you've auditioned for in the past? Well, let me just start off with straight away. Um, Usually when you do a regular audition or when you do like a screen test, like let's say when I did, you know, the um, pairing test for Babysitter's Club, it was like the final audition. And um, it was just kind of like a room with a a bunch of the executives and they were kind of pairing me and all the girls together in a room. And that was kind of it. And they filmed it and then told us that we got the roles and then we left. It was just, and it was just in an office. Now for Dr. Strange, I kind of expected it to kind of be that same thing, but um, you really have to think about it. It is Marvel. So they took me to the studio and um, I went into the set of the New York Sanctum and I did my audition on the set of the New York Sanctum. And so I'm just sitting there and like Benedict is um, just sitting in front of me and I'm just doing the scene with him. And it was actually the pizza scene that we, uh, that's in the movie. We, uh, my audition was that scene and um, it was crazy. Most of the time I was just trying, I was trying to like literally play it cool. I was like, don't, don't try and like, don't be a fan right now. Be this is work. This is how it's gonna go. Be cool. Be chill. Be confident. And yeah, but it was intimidating because there was four cameras going, like four whole setups and the eighty crew people. There, it was just it was literally like a working set. It's like that's not how a normal audition goes. Was that your first audition for the part? No, that was my last audition. My first audition <laughs> was. When I was, <laughs> that'd be scary. No, my I first like, just throw you into the deep end. <laughs> my first audition, um, I was 13 and uh, it was just a self tape and it was for an older version of America. Um, and then, uh, like a few months later, I got a call back and it was completely different than the older version. Uh, it was like she was now younger and, um, and so I did that. I, sent that in and then they were like, oh, she's pinned. And so then I was like, okay, well, there's a chance I might actually do a screen test. And so I ended up doing a bunch of uh, kickbox training and uh, stunt training and tumbling training for a month. Uh, And I did it every other day for a couple hours. So that was like, okay, even if I don't end up getting a (laughs) screen test, at least I have this and it was really fun. It was an awesome experience. And I got those skills now and I can just continue doing this kickbox training. Um, And then few weeks later, they were like, yeah, we want you to come to do the screen test. And I was like, well, thank goodness I have all that kickbox training under my belt because uh, now I can actually go there and like own it. And also I, I do also uh, do martial arts wushu. So I also have that under my belt too. It's just, it's a bunch of just skills that you have to have so that when you're there and you're in the room and they're like, can you do this? Can you do that? I can be like, oh sure. One second. Let me just warm up really quick and then I can do it. It has been forever since I asked this question, but I used to like asking this a lot. So, you know, on uh, like a headshot resume at the very bottom, it has special skills. And usually you find the most random stuff on there. What is the most random skill you would put in that line of your resume? That's funny. Um, You know, (laughs) I wish I... There's a few weird little things, but there's one that I really wish I knew how to do, which is hand boning. Like, I really want to... (laughs) I really want to learn my hand bone. Yeah. Oh, hand bone. Yeah, like hand bone. Oh, that'd be so cool. (laughs) But I I don't know how to do that. I need to learn how to do that. But one thing I can do is I can make like weird cricket sounds with my mouth. Like Okay. I I mean that could come in that could come in handy, you never know. You want me to voice over and do a cricket sound? I got you. I got you. I feel like one day Pixar is going to make a movie about crickets and you are going to be the lead cricket in that voice cast. I will be more than happy to sit there. And And then we'll say it all started here. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So before we jump into Doctor Strange, the actual production process, I did want to ask you about Anthony Mackie because I was reading that he coached you in a Sundance directing lab uh, acting class. And then when you booked the role, he was the first person that you called. So it was just making me wonder, like, what did he do for you in that acting class to make that big of an impression on you? (laughs) Well, it's funny. I actually (laughs) didn't call him when I got the role. I don't have his number. I wish I did. (laughs) And so I could tell him, but, um, no, he actually volunteered to be an acting mentor for um, the Sundance Directing Lab that I was a part of. And um, it, that was probably one of the most 
insane experiences ever because I got to really just, it was a workshop for, uh, you know, this, uh, one, one of the hardest scenes that the director thinks is going to be the hardest to shoot. And so they work it and workshop it. And I got to be a part of it. And I got to be the daughter of uh, Mia Maestro for the role. And it was super cool. It was like acting like 101. Like it was so awesome. And Anthony Mackie got to, was my uh, acting mentor. And it was so cool. <laughs> um, but also very intimidating because at the time, you know, I think he was just, uh, just started in the Marvel movie at that point. And so it was kind of like, it was kind of peeking up there. And so I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> um, but uh, his main note to me back then was like, you know, don't hold back at all. And he was just like, that was mainly his note of just like, go a hundred, a hundred. And, um, and me as a, a kid at that time, I think I was like 11 or 12. I don't know. I think I was 11. Yeah. Um, I was just like, I was scared. I was a little intimidated. I was like, I don't know. I don't know how to do this. Um, but it was really crazy. It's like, it was one of those moments and one of those experiences I'll never forget. This is why you don't rely on IMDb trivia facts for your interview questions. I feel like that. I feel like I read that there. Here, actually, I'll jump ahead and I'll go to that because I do. Clearly, I read IMDb trivia a lot. And usually you get some like really random fun facts about people. I think you have like two or three things on yours. So if you could add something, I guess, in addition to being able to make cricket noises to your IMDb trivia page, what would it be and why? Ooh, uh... I mean, there's a few things that I do that <laughs> I think people would find interesting. Is that, uh, I mean, I take a camera with me wherever I go um, just because I like to photograph things and have fun memories. But one other thing that I always carry around with me is my action figure. That makes me so incredibly happy. I take it everywhere I go. It's like whenever I do press, whenever I go places, whenever I literally have my little mini America with me everywhere I go just because... I'm just proud to have it. <laughs> you should, it's so refreshing to hear about someone embracing something that they're proud of so strongly and like showing it off rather than being like, oh, I'm just going to like do that in my private. Like that's, that's what you should yeah. be doing with your accomplishments. It mainly just shows how, shows me and reminds me how far I've come. Um, and I remember when I first, this is actually a kind of funny, but also sad story is that when, uh, Richie Palmer, uh, was opening his computer. It was like when we were on the set of Dr. Strange reshoots and Benedict was looking at his approvals for his action figure. And I was like, Oh my gosh, no way. Is it your action figure? And he's like, Oh yeah. I mean, it's like, the thing is he's had, to, he's had to go through that for years now, you know? So he's to him, it's not like as special. And so he was kind of like looking at it and like, I don't know if I think my beard looks funny. And I was like, do I have an action figure? And Richie was like, yeah, let, like, let me pull it up. And he pulls it up and it's just like, I see literally it's, the action figure. And it was, I literally just cried. I was like, no, there's like an action figure of me. And Benedict was like, are you crying? <laughs> I was like, no, there's an action figure of me. And um, it was just kind of a surreal moment because, you know, he got to see me kind of seeing it for the first time. And I also got to see it for the first time. It was just like, it was a I don't blame you one bit. That's yeah, huge. Was, I would have cried too. Yeah. I was like, oh, <laughs> All right. Before I even ask you this next question, I want to know, how often have you been asked for the best piece of advice that you got for jumping into the MCU? Oh, probably like almost every interview. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to walk that back and I'm going to flip it around. Now, okay. having been through the experience of making your first gigantic MCU movie, what advice would you give to another actor who's just stepping into the Marvel Cinematic Universe for the very first time? Oh. Cool. Now, <laughs> um, you know, Patrick Stewart gave me great advice and it's something that I will t like carry on um, with me because it, it was just something that I know I needed when I first came in and actually Benedict Wong did that. He welcomed me and he knocked on my trailer door and was just like, you know, I'm here for you. And, you know, if you ever need someone just to talk to you or if you're just lonely or just or you feel a little stressed, come into my trailer and we'll have some tea. And um, And then Patrick Stewart just also said the same thing. He was like, you know, uh, just make sure to pay it forward and, you know, be very welcoming to newer people and never, you never know. Cause sometimes his main thing was that like, sometimes you never know the person who's in front of you might be the hugest star and you don't even know it. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, it's always important to just be kind to everyone and, you know, treat everyone with kindness and respect people. 
And it just really hit me that I was like, yeah, whoever is coming into this and joining it, I really, I want to make sure that I reach out and let them know that I'm, you want to grab coffee? I'm, I'm available. <laughs> there needs to be more people like that in this industry beyond the MCU, like every single corner of it. And it doesn't even matter what industry, any industry out there. I feel like if we yeah, all had yeah. that mentality, the world would be a better place. And if you don't drink coffee, we can have some lunch any place. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, all right. So one thing I love talking about are, you know, the different approaches to acting out there because everyone's got different backgrounds, different techniques. So mm-hmm. of everyone in the Doctor Strange ensemble, which two cast members have two like polar opposite approaches to their work where they use completely different different mm-hmm. techniques where you know if you're acting opposite them, you'll get a completely different experience. Whoa, that's a good question. Um, wow. Well, what I can say is, I mean, Elizabeth Olsen. Um, she's someone that I like. I watched constantly because I was like, I was just mesmerized by her. <laughs> um, but she, uh, I really noticed that she takes the time to get into her character, even if she's been talking to people and she's been socializing and um, being nice and being herself and lovely, <laughs> lovely Lizzie. Um, right before they say ready, she'll be like five seconds and then she'll like take that moment to really get into her zone. Um, and then then she's just ready and she's present. And it's almost like you're not looking at Lizzie anymore. You're looking at Wanda and you're looking at Scarlet Witch. And, um, and also just that she goes 100%. And that was something I was kind of afraid of when I was doing, especially all the superhero stuff. I was afraid to fully go 100%. But just also to see her kind of emotionally, physically, and just like also with her powers and all all that. um, She was constantly going there and wasn't afraid. And I was like, I just need to do that too. Um, But also just, I noticed that a lot of like classically (laughs) trained actors don't actually memorize their lines as well. That was something that I was kind of like, whoa. Um, and they'll only memorize like their monologues. Um, but generally they'll just kind of wing it in the moment because they know their character so well, they know how they would respond and stuff. And they would just work the scene as it was happening. That was something that I was just like, whoa, what is this? (laughs) Especially by someone who just goes by musical theater. And also I have dyslexia. So I memorize everything I do and I memorize my character and my lines and the other person's line so that I know that um, what I'm going to say and I don't mess up the order of the words. <laughs> Why I asked that question, every approach is different. Every approach is valid. It's whatever works best for you. And it's also exciting to hear about how that approach can evolve depending on who you were. Actually, yeah. here's a good follow-up to that. Is there any particular technique you saw anybody else use on set that you kind of put in your back pocket and say to yourself, I want to try that myself on my next movie? Oh, well, I mean, this is not like, this isn't like truly like a technique or anything, but there's something that I actually discovered as I was doing things is that, um, especially when you're doing action stuff and you're shooting things out of order, you'll kind of forget to uh, be in that moment that you were when you last shot it. And so um, let's say I screamed in the last shot. I found out that it's like, it's best to just actually scream. And it's like, I know it's like so annoying. It might be annoying to hear someone scream, but it actually like helps you in the moment because you just feel like you just did it. And you, even though you didn't shoot it like that day, you might've shot it like a week ago, you're now in that moment where you were. And so it's just doing that and just really preparing (laughs) is really important. (laughs) You gave me a good segue there. So there's one very specific shot I wanted to ask you about because it involves a scream. So it's the tunnel scene where America, Dr. Strange and Christine are running from Wanda. America says, where did she go? And then Wanda pops up and you give like an A plus guttural horror movie scream. Does Mm -hmm. something like that just, are you able to make it happen on the spot when you know you have to hit the right like timing for something like that? Or is Sam doing something offset to make that feel so exceptionally genuine? (laughs) Well, it's so funny because, um, you know, it, a, a lot of, I did lots of screaming and lots of crying and lots of cry screaming and war cries. And just, it was lots of that all the time. Um, but for that specific scene, which is so funny that you bring that up, um, is that you? I think you'll actually see in the next shot right when they go back to us, I'm screaming, but there's no sound. Um, 
And it was because I was faking it uh, because all the cameramen and all these, you know, guys uh, were just like, you know, you, you kind of saying little comments like, you know, you know, that that screen was real loud. That was a loud, a loud one. And it was just like, I was like, oh, man, I'm, I know it's my job to like be screaming and doing it and all that. And it's just but of course, with the tunnel and all that, it was just like, I like, OK, I get it, y'all. I don't want to be hurting your eardrums. So I was like, I'm going to fake scream and I'm going to just fake do it. And um, and I that's what it looked like. And like it was so funny because like Rachel McAdams was like looking back at the playback and she's like, that's a good fake scream. Can't believe you just did that. And I was like, I don't know. I'm just winging it. <laughs> I'm just giving it. I'm just going 100. And if it looks funny, it looks funny. If it doesn't, it, then yay. <laughs> I love that. I am a big horror movie nut. I am obsessed with that genre. And the fact that this movie feels so Sam Raimi to me is one of my absolute favorite things about it. And I watch a moment like that and I'm like, so when are you going to sign up for a horror movie? Yeah, well, what was so funny is that I was never asked to scream in the audition or do any of this kind of horror elements of like acting scared or anything like that. So it's kind of, I don't, they they took a, just a long shot of just hoping that I could do it um, because the scene that I did for my audition was super sassy and confident and just, you know, I actually messed up my line. So it was like left me impro improvising and just kind of fixing it and going with it and just being this kind of girl that just continues. And, um, and I was never, I was never asked to scream. I was never asked if I could cry on like, like that, which I can't. So it was kind of like me going like, okay, kind of have to learn how to do that too. Um, but it was lots of learning things and just, also figuring out what, what works best. Cause especially when I was at that age, I mean, I just want to like laugh and, you know, have fun. So it was hard for me to just cry on cue. So it was also finding like, like what works best, you know, do you have to like listen to a song? Do you have to think of a memory? And I was like, well, I, I mean, I'm only 14 at the time. I was like, I don't know. I don't have any like traumatic things that have happened to me in my life like that. And so it was just, uh, what I found worked worked best was like putting um, menthol in my eyes, like putting it in my corner of my eyes and putting it under my nose. Um, really just kind of helped be there because I was like, emotionally, I could be there, but like the tears weren't physically coming down. And I was like, why is it not coming down? Just like call, roll down. And so <laughs> I would find myself in the middle of the scene going like, calm down. Um, Being so able just, to cry yeah. on cue is almost like a superpower in and of itself. <laughs> and let me tell you that Elizabeth Olsen, she can do that. What and can so she like, do? I write. Tell, I just, tell me Elizabeth one. Olsen. Tell me one thing Elizabeth Olsen can't do. I I'm, I swear, if she, even if she said she couldn't do something, I'd be like, take like a few weeks to practice that and like really train it, and I'm sure you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> I would very much believe that. Um, yeah. Jumping, in, jumping into the powers, I, I, this might be me overthinking things, but did you ever kind of think about or maybe talk through what it feels like to America when she uses her powers out of fear versus using them with the ability to control them? That's a good question. Yeah. I mean, with America's powers, before she just didn't really know how to control them. And it was just all fear based. And it was um, like, it was just anything that was fearful to her. She was like peak fear point, um, just triggered, triggered it. And, um, and it was really fun to film those things. Cause it was also just kind of this like eye rolling situation that also was kind of the point as well. Um, which was something that was, that is very Sam Raimi, very eye, uh, visual, you know, and it was really cool <laughs> to do that. But uh, I think the difference is that it was just her realizing that she can actually control it. Um, and I think it was, it's kind of also from the Wizard of Oz in a sense, uh, you know, Galinda, you know, you had it all along, that kind of uh, <laughs> I'm thinking of it that so, way. So, so full circle with Sam Raimi and stuff. So, uh, Oh God, I completely forgot about that. You're so right. Yeah. <laughs> my when it, Whenever uh, I think about Sam, my mind immediately gets buried in everything Evil Dead because I'm full-blown obsessed with that franchise. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of just kind of to come back and revisit his earlier work. I mean, you can definitely see lots of uh, references to his earlier work, and I think that was definitely one of them. Um, I know there was, we were going to do a line, but I, I was just like, I don't think America would say this. It doesn't work. <laughs> like, what was it? Um, I forgot what the line was. 
Um, but it was, yeah, it was one, it was one of the lines and I was, it was at a moment where it was like in the middle of running and stuff. And I was like, oh, I don't think this works. <laughs> and we tried, we tried our best. It was it from was, Evil Dead or from Oz and Great Power? It was from Oz. Ah, oh, okay, okay. All right. Yeah. Stuff like that. You could play around with it, but then it's probably better we, off if it doesn't work. Yeah, we tried. Way. We really did. We spent like, we like did, spent the whole day and then we tried coming back after lunch and it was just like, we looked back at it and we were like, this looks silly. <laughs> and even Sam was like, we tried. <laughs> That's all you can do sometimes. I will say with the fear-based use of her power, I don't think I've ever seen anything more relatable in the MCU than her opening up a portal because of a bee. <laughs> yeah. I'm terrified of bees. I would have done the same thing in that moment. Yeah. I mean, I, could there have been something a little stronger? Maybe. But, you know, I, it, it's something that I think is honestly funny. Um, and... I think that will be a running joke. And um, honestly, you can't overthink it when it comes to that kind of thing. Um, I know <laughs> I know Benedict did think overthink it a little bit and go like, mm, I don't know. And I was like, you know, you can't really overthink superheroes and you can't really overthink their the movies too much. Um, you have to really think about the, the, the story and the message behind it all. And obviously we see a lot of that through Wanda's trauma. <laughs> You need the little, I really do deeply believe this, you need the little things like that because that is a very grounded, realistic moment to me, at <laughs> least as as someone who is like like almost up and left her two-year-old niece because there are bees and I'm afraid of the bees and she's not. <laughs> so there you go. I am proof that that is a legit moment right there. Okay, well, if it, it's a legit moment, then it is a legit moment. <laughs> oh, God, I shouldn't have admitted that. All right, before I let you go... So I, I know you're not able to say much about what lies ahead for the character, but I think I have two safe questions to play around with here. What would you say is a new quality or an asset that America gains during Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness that you're most excited to get to play with in future projects? I mean, that one's kind of obvious. Um, you know, with the mystic arts, we see it at Camartage. Fair enough. Um, and I had fun, you know, being on set, especially that, I think that was, not one of the last days, but it was towards the end. And it was just kind of mind blowing to see, you know, all these people come together and there were so many of them. And they were just, just this kind of surreal moment when you see them in the whole outfits too. Um, it just feels so like war, like, you know, <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, that was fun. Um, but yeah, I mean, besides America, uh, I'm excited for the next phase of the MCU. Um, but in the meantime, I mean, I haven't heard anything, so I don't know. I, I'm over here just kind of going, what do I do next? And finding the next project after Marvel movie is tricky. So I just kind of been filling my time and I, I did recently co-direct a music video. So I'm, I'm doing that. What is the music video? Can you tell us about that? Uh, yeah, it was, um, for, uh, Gia, what's her, dang it. Oh no. Her name's Gia. She was on she was on Dance Moms. She's a singer now. And she is I can't say the name of the song, but um she it's a really good song and I'm really excited for it to come out. But um yeah, the uh the director, Luke Eisner, he is a friend of mine. He was like, I would love for you to, you know, help me co direct this. And it was at first it was me just kind of going, I would love to kind of shadow you and see how, you know, working on a music video works because I want to be a director. And so I know that some of my favorite music, uh, my favorite directors started out in music videos. And so I was like, well, I don't want to just climb to the top. We've got to start at music videos. And um, so I asked him, I was like, hey, can I, you know, shadow you? And he was like, actually, can you just, would you like to just be the co-director? And so I, I was like, of course, he sent me the song and the lyrics. And I just came up with a few like different ideas and, um, and I pitched it to him and he was like, I love it. Let's do it. And so we just did it. <laughs> we did everything that I said we should do, which is kind of crazy that he like let me have that much uh, like say into it. Um, and then on the day, I mean, it was really exciting because I just I also realized how not only the camera works and all that, but um, how much work it is to kind of direct people and watch, um, you know, it all watching the person perform and how much different ways people need that kind of hype up, you know? 
I was like, how can I, like, let's say I want to make her do this or kind of direct her to do this. How can I get that performance out of her? And which is also one way for me as an actor thinking about that. I was like, wow, this is a whole other thing, you know, which is so fun. I find it really uh, new and exciting. <laughs> I could go down that path and discuss learning about the behind the scenes elements all day long. I have to let you go soon. So I'll squeeze in my last, uh, my last Marvel okay. question for you. And it's another like future one, but I think it's kind of safe to play with. What do you, th so like she goes through this like big evolution and discovers how to harness her power and grows quite a bit throughout uh, Doctor Strange too. But what do you think is her biggest weakness at this point? Like what is the next big thing she's gonna have to overcome to become an even stronger hero in this franchise? <laughs> Whoa, that is a good question. Oh my goodness. Try. <laughs> um, well, I mean, at this point, you know, she has has she's getting over her trust issues, obviously, and I feel like she just needs a place to call home and she needs some discipline and structure in her life. And I think Wong is doing that, but I think one thing she definitely needs to learn is she needs to learn to work with others. <laughs> Um, okay. That's fair obviously, enough. Obviously, she's been working alone, and she's also just been destined to be a, a leader. So, in order to be a leader, you also have to learn to work with others and help one another. And I think she has the she has the qualities to be an amazing leader. But I think there's a few other things she has to learn first. All righty. I like that. I like that. I can't wait to see her journey continue, and I can't wait to see everything you do with the music video and beyond. Congratulations. Congratulations on everything you've accomplished thus far, but also in particular, we're here to celebrate Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, which is available on digital. Now it's also available on 4K, DVD, and Blu-ray. Go watch it and obsess over it frame by frame like I did. I'm obsessed with your movie. You are awesome. Huge congratulations and thank you for being here. Thank you. This is so fun. I had so much fun talking to you today. <laughs>